Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, the new apologetic series that we're doing on the divinity of the Son of Man. In fact, uh, we want to call it the divine Son of Man of Daniel. And we're talking about, of course, the prophet Daniel and his reference to someone like the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. Of course, the reason why I wanted to focus on this has to do with the fact that many times our Muslim friends, and, you know, I'm sure there's others as well, that assume just because Jesus called himself the Son of Man in many occasions, that mean his divinity is absent from that. In other words, they say if he was so excited to call himself the Son of Man many times, and he used it more probably often than any other descriptions of himself, then how come you, as a follower of Jesus, insist that he's divine? Because the Son of Man indicate, at least just the way it is said, Son of Man indicate his humanity. Well, while that is true that it indicates his humanity, also it indicates his divinity as we will demonstrate throughout this particular video series. Last time we gave just an overview and an introduction. Today we're going to start taking a, a trip basically through... Uh, some of the teachings that we can find basically in the Jewish writings, whether, uh, you know, based on the, um, uh, you know, the Torah, uh, or I should say based on the Old Testament or based on apocryphal writings. Either way, our, in, uh, you know, uh, in <coughs> our basically our focus has to do with the understanding of the Jewish people and especially the teachers of the Ju uh, Jewish, uh, you know, uh, uh, rabbis, I should say. Uh, how did they understand the title Son of Man? And uh, when we look at early Jewish teachings, for instance, you know, from, from the really the, the very beginning, the Son of Man title of that Son of Man character in Daniel was identified as the Messiah, the Anointed One, not just anyone, the Christ, basically. In fact, this has been basically the traditional Orthodox interpretation uh, one held by the majority of both Jews and Christians for over at least 1,700 years. I mean, even noted uh, in, in one of the critical liberal commentaries, uh, one of the liberal biblical commentaries or scholars, you know, admitted the fact, you know, the following. He says, you know, traditional interpretation, uh, basically the earliest interpretations and adaptations, and I'm reading a quote here, of the one like a human being, Jewish and Christian alike, assume that the phrase refers to an individual and is not a symbol for a collective entity. In other words, whenever that's used, we're talking about a specific individual, not talking about maybe a group of people or, or something to that extent. Now, in the Similitudes of Enoch, that's a book basically, uh, First Enoch chapter 46, verse 1, the white-headed head of days, that's what he was called in there, is accompanied by one whose face had the appearance of a man. It's almost like this is an allusion to Daniel chapter 7, where you have the ancient of days, where you have the ancient of days, the father has white-headed white hair, and accompanied uh, in chapter uh, 7, verse 13, it says, and uh, I saw in the vision, uh, one like the Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days. So that's what is referring to here. You know, basically, uh, had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of grace, like one of the holy angels. He is explicitly called Messiah, or Anointed One, in uh, basically in First Enoch 48 uh, verse 10, or first Enoch 52, verse 4, and this name was named before, and his name, I should say, was named before creation. He was chosen one before creation even began. In other words, he pre existed, technically speaking. And you find this also in first Enoch chapter 48, verse 3. And by the way, I just want to give credit to my uh, dear brother Sam Shimon because uh, most of my research that I've done had to do with a number of things that he himself has wrote on. So I just want to give credit to my dear brother here for that. Now, in uh, four, or, or fourth Ezra, or, you know, the, the book of Ezra, uh, you know, the fourth letter, if you wish, or the fourth book, that's another apocryphal writing, chapter 13, for Ezra 13, the man who rises from the sea and flies with the clouds of heaven, again, flying with the clouds of heaven indicate a divine person, is also a messianic figure, 
but like that son of man in the similitudes. Again, referring back to Enoch. He is a pre-existent, meaning before creation, and he existed with the Father for all of eternity. Supernatural figure, right? And this is he whom the Most High has been keeping for many ages. You find this in 4 Ezra 13, verse 26. Okay? So, to summarize all of this, basically, I know there's a lot, by the way, of references, and, and I just didn't want to exhaustive, uh, use an exhaustive uh, you know, uh, list of them. Just that to give you a, a quick view of what's going on. In summary, traditional interpretations of the one like a human being in the first millennium overwhelmingly, basically, favored the understanding of this figure as an individual, not a collective symbol, and the most usual identifica uh, identification of this individual was that he is the Messiah. But in the earliest adaptations of the vision, like the similitudes, you know, or fourth Enoch, uh, Ezra, uh, and the Gospels also, the figure in question had distinctly supernatural characteristics. Okay, uh, here's another source. Uh, the Hermenia, uh, it's a critical and a historical commentary on the Bible, a commentary on the book of Daniel in particular, by John J. Collins with an essay. The essay title is The Influence of Daniel on the New Testament by Adela Yarbrough Collins, edited by Frank Moore Cross, Fortress Press, Minneapolis, in 1993, Pages three, uh, 306 all the way to 308. Okay? Pages 306 to 308. We read the following. The Messianic interpretation remained standard in both Jewish and Christian traditions to the Enlightenment, but is rarely defended in recent times. Okay? There are, to be sure, elements in the vision that lend themselves to a Messianic figure, Messianic interpretation, and provided the basis for the traditional understanding. That's what Collins says uh, in The Scepter and the Star. The Messiahs of the Dead Sea Scroll and other ancient literature, okay? Uh, in chapter 2, The Fallen Booth of David, Messianism and the Hebrew Bible in page 36, okay? Messianism and the Hebrew Bible in page 36 of this uh, source that I just mentioned. Conservative biblical scholars such as Stephen Miller, Stephen R. M Miller, concurs also. He says, third in his discussion of this figure, only one person may properly be identified as the Son of Man, and that person is Jesus Christ as the New Testament apostles and Christ himself confirmed. Montgomery also acknowledges that the Messianic view is the eldest and in past Jewish and Christian exegesis the prevailing opinion. In other words, if you go to all these early commentaries on this passage of Daniel, an understanding of the Son of Man of Daniel, it's always been, uh, you know, focusing on the person of the Messiah. Okay, for example, over 15 Hundred years ago, Jerome himself, Saint Jerome, who wrote the, uh, by the way, the Volga, uh, the Volgar, uh, in the Latin, basically, uh, the the Latin Vulgate. Um, uh, my apology, I meant the Vulgate, basically. That's the Latin translation of the Old Testament. Uh, Jerome was espousing this view, uh, meaning that this figure is the Messiah. And the list can go on and on. For, for instance, uh, Slotkey notes that rabbinical exegesis interpreted this person to be the Messiah. Another person by name Jeffrey points out that the Talmud in Sanhedrin 98a, A as an apple, accepted this interpretation. That's a, a very authoritative teaching by Jewish rabbis. Okay? So, what we are basically left with now is a number of questions. And the questions are, what would have caused the Jews to believe that the Daniel son of man was actually a person who is called the Messiah? And why would they think that this heavenly figure 
was the anointed one who would come to fulfill God's promises to King David. And most importantly, of course, were they correct in their interpretation and was the New Testament correct in this adaptation? Those are the kind of questions that I want to end this episode with, but we are going to pick it up from here next time we meet. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.